non-compete highlights. July 6, 2021. History YouTubers are a very, it's a very popular format now on this platform. And a lot of pop history that you see is based on narratives rather than actually trying to go and explore and discover truth. And the perspective we get about history and about society uh, usually comes to us through uh, through sources that reinforce our the, the hegemonic status quo, right? So this YouTuber, uh, it's called, the, the name of the channel is Tick, T-I-K, and they've produced a one hour and 42 minute documentary uh, called Public Versus Private, The Historic Definitions of Socialism and Capitalism. For the first time on this channel, we have to go right back to the dawn of Western civilization. So let's do that. In the earliest days of ancient Greece and Rome, you had the family. The concept of the individual had not been created yet. Instead, you were part of your family, and the good that you did or the bad that you did impacted the honor or value of your family. Each family had a hearth and a sacred fire. You would offer sacrifices to that fire, because the fire represented both your family and your family's ancestors. Your ancestors, your gods, lived underground as spirits and were embodied in the fire, which is why you would offer the fire food and drink and sacrifices. The fire could not be allowed to go out, as your ancestors were still alive as part of the fire. The family, not the individual, was the basis of society. A family did not share anything in common with another family. They were completely separate. Even in late Roman times, the houses had to be a minimum of 2.5 feet from each other and could not share a common wall because the gods of the family have to have their own homes. And the sale of property was forbidden. Men now, the whole narrative that's being constructed here, the whole, the whole framework is this idea of public versus private. So that's why we're talking about this, I suppose, and um, how this relates to socialism and capitalism. So this is, yeah, this is establishing that Initially, in ancient Greece, which is apparently the birthplace of all civilization in all of the West. Uh, so this is very important for us to understand, apparently. This public hierarchy was the structure of the central state. This is why today we call the state the public sector, meaning noun, the part of the economy which is controlled by the state. The word public, even to this day, retains the same meaning as the hierarchy of ancient times. From the Oxford English Dictionary, public, adjective one, of or concerning the people as a whole, two, open to or shared by all the people of an area or country, three, of or involved in the affairs of the community, especially in government or entertainment, four, of or provided by the state rather than an independent commercial company. There are other words too which can be used in place of the word public or state. These include words like common, which means adjective belonging to or involving the whole of the community or the public at large, e.g. Now, this is stuff that uh, when I debated Milton Friedman's son, David Friedman, he tried to get really deep into this whole public and common idea. This is a huge component of like the ANCAP ideology. The way that they try to present the idea of public and common ownership is, is just does not reflect reality. I mean, so like, for instance, there's really no recognition uh, that, for instance, the air, it's like common publicly owned, right? Like we all breathe the same air. And yet you could build a factory that pumps uh, pollution into the air. And, and that's supposed to be um, a private activity because you own the factory. It's your personal private property. You own the, the car that's, that's polluting the air, but it's polluting like all of our air, right? So like you can't, so, so there, there are so many situations, that's just one example, but there's so many situations where this breaks down this idea of like the private versus the public. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, so, so what they're doing is they're engaging what's in metaphysics. Metaphysics is this philosophical concept that things can be sort of segmented and broken up into a bunch of different disparate, isolated concepts and things and objects in and of themselves, right? Whereas as socialists, uh, I personally subscribe to dialectical materialism, which is this idea that first of all, there is no thing that exists in and of itself. Things are constantly in a state of change and things have dynamic relations with each other and, and, and nothing is like a static thing, right? So the whole idea that there, there is the private and there is the public, and these are two very distinct concepts, that's, that's a, a major fallacy right off the bat. That's, a, that's just an erroneous 
position to begin with. And and the rest of this narrative is kind of built on this on this concept. Three, a commercial organization consisting of several companies under common ownership. I'm sorry. Four, nation. Noun, a large body of I'm people sorry. united um, by common descent, history, I don't know culture, why we're, language. I don't know why the right always wants to go to the dictionary, like right off the bat, as though it's some sort of font of uh, <laughs> intrinsic wisdom. I guess that the dictionary is a pretty metaphysical construct, though. It's like, here's a word. It has this definition. All right, we're getting back into back on the back on track the here. Society, the social group, the collective, the common or commune. Whatever. They all mean the same thing. The hierarchy of the public state. At the core of ancient thinking, we have found... I want to look at this uh, little chart again, because there's something... Okay. So the whole idea is that... They're, so th they're trying to build this uh, dichotomy, where we have the private, which is things that are owned by individuals, um, and then there's the public, which are things that are owned collectively by the group, the common. And, and then they, they call that the state. As though in a capitalist society, the state is not run by a very tiny minority of individuals. As though capitalist society were not uh, controlled directly by a very, very, very small minority of people. Remember that three families in the United States of America, just three individual families in the United States of America own the same amount as wealth uh, the, the same amount of wealth as the 50% poorest people in the USA. And that, of course, those capitalists who have those billions and billions of dollars amassed through the capitalist process of accumulation sit at the top of this pyramid in the state. And, and you have a small number of individuals who pull the levers of that state apparatus. Which is also true, by the way, of the private sector, since the small number of corporations that exist those levers are also being pulled by a small number of individuals. So like most of us have probably seen a chart like this where we see that uh, six companies own 90% of American media companies in 1983. Oh, so in, 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 sorry, in 1983, it was 50 companies. In 2011, it was six companies. So this is how cap capitalist accumulation works and consolidation works. And of course, a very small number of people own the overwhelming majority of the shares in these in these corporations. So um, this is not something that's distributed to the common wheel or or publicly held or anything like that. That's a that's a completely false assumption. Descent, history, culture or language inhabiting a particular state or territory. The public, the public sector, the nation, the society, the social group, the collective, the common or commune, whatever. They all mean the same thing. The hierarchy of the public state. At the core of ancient thinking, we have found the assumption of natural inequality. Whether in the domestic sphere, in public life, or when contemplating the cosmos, Greeks and Romans did not see anything like a level playing field. Rather, they instinctively saw a hierarchy or pyramid. Then came Jesus, or at least Paul's interpretation of Jesus as he wrote about him. Prior to this point, you were a member of your family, and your actions were a reflection of your ancestors, your gods, your family. I mean, I think it's safe to say that this is all a historical interpretation, but I'm not going to stress that point because it's really immaterial to the arguments that are made throughout the rest of this video. In fact, this is all basically uh, immaterial yeah, to all of the arguments that are made for the rest of this documentary. So I will concede the point, I guess. It doesn't really matter to me whether this stuff is historical or ahistorical your or social group. You were accurate part reflection of, your of reality family, because your society. You were not an individual. It's really just kind of a waste but of time. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He said, "Your individual actions will be judged not by your family or society, but by God, and He will judge you alone. You are responsible for your own life, and you will go to heaven or hell based on what you do, not based on what your family or your society does. If another member of your family commits the interpretation, by the way, that Jesus." And Christianity was an individualistic phenomenon early on in the foundation. Contradicts everything I've read about the early Christians, who were very collectivist. But again, immaterial to the main point, and something I'm willing it's to murder. Kind of you don't go to jail for it. Here if, you uh, are not guilty by association pressed. in the eyes of God. Whether you believe in him or not, Jesus' significance for the history of humanity is profound. 
This was the invention of the concepts of the individual. Every human being. And this is, okay, I got to mention too, again, this is a narrative. Obviously, individuality existed before Jesus and also around the world <laughs> in various ways and manifestations. So this is very much a narrative that is being constructed that, okay, first there was in ancient Greece only, in this one little place called ancient Greece, which was the fountain of all Western civilization, there was no such thing as an individual. And then suddenly Jesus came along in a totally different region and invented individuality. And then that changed this entity that is the West so that now the individual was the focus. Like this is, do you see the problems here? Like this is not a this is not a this is not how we do history. This is not how we do the work of historical analysis. It's it's a very strange uh and, and um amorphous and, and uh eclectic is now individually responsible for their own lives. Paul's vision on the road to Damascus amounted to the discovery of human freedom, of a moral agency <laughs> potentially available to each and everyone, that is, to individuals. This universal freedom with its moral implications was never mind that. People were discussing human freedom around the world in various organizations and discussing the relate, like for instance, in China, they had, they were, they had, we have manuscripts from China from before this period when people were talking about the role of the state and the role of the individual and Taoist texts that were talking about human freedom and individual liberty and ancient Greek philosophers who predated Jesus, who talked about all of these things. <laughs> including, you know, a few names you might have heard of, like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Never mind all that. We have a narrative to build. So let's keep going. from the freedom enjoyed by the privileged class of citizens in the polis. Okay. The Christ provides a foundation in the nature of things for a pre-social or individual will. Individual agency acquires roots in divine agency. The Christ stands for the presence of God in the world, the ultimate support for individual identity. The private individual is born. Prior to this point, private meant a small group or family-sized unit at the bottom of the hierarchy. And it still does. But now it also meant the individual within that small group or family. An individual who owns his own private tools and private workshop is a private individual. And a small family who own... But when you rise higher on the hierarchy, you shift from private control to public control. To go public is when a company makes shares available on the stock market for the first time. This is a really common capitalist apologist talking point. Uh, and, it, and it ties in with the idea that everyone owns a corporation collectively. It's a collective experience. It's not what it's not. And the idea that like capitalist entities aren't owned by just a few people, it's owned by everyone. We have 401ks, you know? Well, the fact is, first of all, only about 55% of people in the USA, the wealthiest, most capitalist country in the world, own stocks. And the stocks that are held, for, the, for you to understand this, you have to understand the CMC and the MCM modes of circulation, which I've made a whole video on that if you want to go check it out on my channel, Non-Compete. Um, but the long story short is stocks are fetishized commodities on the stock market. Nobody buys stock in Ford Motor Company because, I mean, very, very, very few people. Most people do not buy shares in stocks in the Ford Motor, Motor Company, Ford Motor Company, because they actually care about the cars that are being produced. I mean, they might learn news and information about it because they might want to make better bets, right? Because the stock market is really just a casino. But at the end of the day, you're fetishizing those commodities and you're not buying stocks in Ford because you care about the employees of Ford or the consumers of Ford or the cars that are being produced, except in the most abstract sense that you want the value of that stock to go up. So a stock in that sense is a fetishized commodity. It is a store of value and people invest in the stock market with the hopes that they'll put money into it and then they'll get more money out than they put in. In this kind of system, these commodities are really not much different than fiat currency or gold or any other store of value you might be holding on to. There's a reason that wealthy people tend to own stocks instead of US dollars or, or fiat currency is because of inflation. So you know, you're gonna have positive interest Generally speaking, if you invest in the stock market and you're wealthy and you can wait out the highs and lows and all that kind of thing, um, whereas fiat currencies is just going to constantly lose value. But at the end of the day, 
Um, there is extreme wealth inequality with stock ownership, just as there is with fiat currency ownership. So in other words, only about 55% of Americans own stocks at all. And then the distribution of those stocks, if you look up the numbers, the stocks are in the hands of a very small amount of people. And then the majority of people who even own stocks, they own a very, very small, minuscule amount of stocks, okay? Which is exactly the same case with fiat currency. So that's why the amount of wealth in the United States, three individual families own the equivalent to the 50% poorest families. And that's true of all forms of asset and wealth, not just fiat currency, but also stocks as well. So we've created a system that gives you an illusion of collective ownership and an illusion that we are all bought into the system. And by the way, in the, in the process of doing so, in building this 401k system, which is how you know, so many people own stocks, we have gutted the pension system and the retirement systems that people were actually benefiting from. There's been a lot of research into that. The 401k system is a lot less stable. I mean, imagine if you had retired in 2007, 2008, or imagine if you had retired in 2020 when the stock market was just totally tanked and you had to pull out some money. Yeah, it's 100% a casino. It is different from fiat currency. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it is volatile and uncertain, but here's the thing too. It, it, that is another thing that benefits the wealthy, the volatility and the uncertainty. That's why Warren Buffett said that the stock, machine, the stock market is an engine or a machine that takes money away from the inpatient and gives it to the patient. W what is the source of impatience when it comes to the ownership of assets? Why would you be impatient about it? Probably because you need to use your, your money. You need, to, you need money to buy things to live. So people who are workers who have to work for a living are much more likely to have some kind of emergency, especially if the economy starts to tank, where they'll need to get their money out of the stock market and buy food or make a payment on their house if they get fired or fix their car if it breaks down. Whereas extremely wealthy people can ride out that volatility and ride out the lows and highs and even buy in when the economy goes down in ways that working people can't do. So that's another way in which the NCM CMC relationships, those, those modes of circulation, benefit the extremely wealthy at the expense of the working class. And that's another form of accumulation. And if you look at the, like a Wyckoff distributions and look at the ways in which wealthy entities, corporations, and, and, and the people who work for wealthy corporations in terms of investment, they are very good at very sophisticated maneuvers and operations, which siphon up wealth from the poor in the stock market and put them into the accounts of wealthy people. It's, it's, been, you, you, it's been very well documented going all the way back to like the 1920s and the first big stock market crash. Uh, and people have been doing it for even longer, for as long as markets have existed. Like, and, and I mean, stock markets, speculative markets. Um, this is a myth. That's the whole point. This is, a, this is a myth that a corporation is actually a public entity. It's very much not. It's just given this veneer of being a public entity when really the, the extreme overwhelming majority of wealth is in a very small number of hands. So a company that goes public is no longer owned by individuals or small families, but is owned collectively by a wider portion of society. Anyone? No. In fact, there's more wealth disparity now than there was under feudalism <laughs> and monarchy. Uh, and somebody like Jeff Bezos uh, has, a, has a, a degree of wealth that has never been paralleled in human history, globally speaking. So. Um, this is just completely flat out wrong. See, it's very odd to me, it's very odd. This whole quote unquote hierarchy says that this is a, a more individualistically aligned system and it's better for everybody because there's more ownership distributed. But notice that the employees and the consumers have no ownership whatsoever and no agency whatsoever, right? Like if I'm an employee, um, I don't own a share of that corporation. I might have some in my 401k or whatever, but I certainly don't have any kind of ownership of my own labor. If I'm a consumer and I buy a product, um, I don't, that doesn't give me any kind of entitlement or ownership or agency within this entity, right? Now this side, we see a little bit more because investors do technically get voting you know, power when they, with, with their shares, but you have to have a massive amount of votes to have any kind of true agency over this entity. It's nothing like a democracy or anything like that. Um, you'd have to, I mean, if you're talking about a massive corporation, the kinds of institutions that have significant, massive, overwhelming control over our society, institutions like Facebook, Amazon, YouTube, the platform I'm on right now, 
you have to have a significant amount of wealth to own enough stocks to have any kind of agency in, in that company. One can so. buy shares in the company. It's private in the sense that your eye may not be able to just walk into its head office and visit the executive bathroom, but it's no longer a private company. It is a public company. It's owned by society as a whole, or at least it's not a society which wishes to own it. It's owned by a fraction of a fraction of society, right? It's owned by the majority shareholders in every meaningful sense of that term. So you don't get a vote on the operations of the corporation unless you own something close to a controlling share, which amounts to billions of dollars with the kinds of institutions that have so much power in our society. And then for all the, again, going back to the casino idea, for all the other people, the small people who have a small fraction of the ownership of the company, it really is just a speculative casino and a fetishization of commodities. Yeah, so a lot of people are forced to invest in the stock market against their will. That's another thing. It's like you're forced to have a minority share, right? Like it's coercive in the sense that if you want to work for your company or whatever, so di different situations have, have, have these, uh, different these, uh, these, these, these um, strings attached where like you have to have a 401k or you have to buy into this system or whatever. And then it's like, you don't actually have a controlling chair, share. So it's like you're being forced to gamble. And then you also have no agency within the corporate structure that you're forced to buy into. It's like the worst of both worlds. Skills and weapons are the best investment for Americans, I think. There are worse, there are much worse investments than those two. I would have to echo that, depending on your personal uh, capacities and such. The stock market is completely manipulated and fake. The GameStop Robin Hood short squeeze in February of this year proved it once and for all. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, and the idea that the market is rational, is which, is which this video will get into, but it also disproved that once and for all. But what we saw with that was what's been happening all along. It just happened very publicly in a way that was sort of unprecedented, kind of unprecedented. But they did this stuff like that years ago, with like Volkswagen. So this is not um, completely unprecedented, but it's something we've known for a long time. The stock market's completely manipulated. And all the regulation that exists, who are the people that are doing that regulating? They're people that go and have drinks every night with the people who are uh, gambling on the stock market. That's a fact. There's a revolving door between the regulation agencies and the stock market. This is, not, this is not news to anybody. Subscribe, 